I'm Victoria Grady. I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, it's exciting to be on the last day of a great conference, ACMB 2019. I hope we'll see you all in Los Angeles next year. If you haven't heard, the um, conference next year is in Anaheim, California, literally across the street from Disneyland. So I don't know. I might have to schlep my kids with me to that one because um, I haven't been to Disneyland. This morning, we have a great speaker coming to us from New York City. Um, Mike is the co-founder of a company that's the result of a failed change. <laughs> so I think that's super cool. The name of his company is August Public Inc. And it's super cool that he and his partners are born out of um, an initiative that we're here spending three um, intense days talking about. Some fun facts about Mike um, are that he was a theater major in undergrad, and he actually studied <laughs> with Amy Poehler for improv and comedy. I think that is super cool, right? So now I'm like one removed from a famous person. Woo! <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to turn the, the mic over to Mike. Um, this morning. That was funny. Yeah, come on. I'm trying really hard. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so anyway, let's uh, all welcome Mike to the stage with a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. In 1958, a group of about 30 uh, naval um, and Air Force test pilots gathered in a room in Washington, D.C. And they didn't know why they were there, but a few months earlier, uh, the Soviets had launched Sputnik, the first uh, satellite sent into space. And the person in charge comes out, comes out into the room, he says, the reason why you're all here is because you've been selected by NASA as potential candidates for something we're calling the Mercury Program. And the Mercury program is going to figure out how to send a human being into outer space. Yeah. We're going to send a human being into outer space. Imagine that you're one of those test pilots sitting in, in that room. And we don't know how we're going to build the thing that's going to get you there. And we haven't found anyone yet who's going to go. Um, but what do you think, right? If you were one of those pilots, you might have some questions, right? And this is a true story, by the way. This actually happened. And the pilot sitting in that room did have some questions. So, you know, first hand goes up. Uh, this, uh, this missile that you're planning to use to send us into space, don't they have a bad habit of blowing up on the launch pad? Uh, yes, yes, they do, and we're working on that. Yeah. And what about this, uh, this capsule you're going to put us in? Um, do you have a prototype built of that yet? No, but we do have some blueprints. Um, OK, and um, how do we fly this thing? Well, actually, you're not going to fly it. It's going to be remote controlled from the ground. OK, one, one more question. Um, how do we land it? Yeah, so about that. Um, there's not going to be a landing per se. It's going to be more of, more of a crash into the ocean somewhere, and then the Navy's going to find you and come fish you out. Right? I was reminded of this story because I spent the last week um, in Florida with my family. I have a six-year-old son, a uh, one-and-a-half-year-old daughter, um, and, and we were near uh, the Kennedy Space Center. And I was just thinking, what is that, what's that mindset of someone who is so comfortable with that level of change and uncertainty in their future, right? Because many of those pilots sitting in that room that day heard all of that and thought to themselves, sign me up. That sounds awesome. I can't wait to do it, right? And what do organizations need to do to make that level of change and uncertainty safe or at least make it OK for people to go along with that, right? So that's a bit of what I want to talk about today. How do, how do you do that? How do you make change and uncertainty easier to navigate, easier 
to deal with, easier to be successful in the face of that change and uncertainty. My name's Mike Arouse. I work at this company, August. We do organizational change and transformation work. We work with big corporations, um, nonprofits, government agencies. Um, and what we've discovered is there are ways, there are things that we can do to, to translate kind of the, the tools and practices of change into really practical things that anybody inside of any organization doing any kind of work can use and apply in their day-to-day -day work to make change a little bit easier. There are three things we're gonna cover. First, we're gonna talk about how has the world around us changed, right? And then how does this discipline of change management need to evolve and change in response to that? And then we're gonna get into some really specific practical things that you can take back to your organizations and begin to introduce um, into your work. So first, a quick survey. I'm gonna read a set of statements. I want you to raise your hand if these things uh, sound familiar. All right, so first question. Have you ever worked with somebody who haggles over the precise wordings of communications, minutes, and resolutions? Yeah, get those hands up, yep. Have you ever worked with someone who refers back to matters decided upon at the last meeting and attempts to reopen the question of the advisability of that decision? Yes, a lot of hands. Have you ever worked with someone who insists on doing everything through channels and never permits shortcuts to be taken in order to expedite decisions? Yes, a lot of hands, uh, certainly myself included. I've got some sad news for you. You are being sabotaged. Those statements that, I, that we just read, those are actual instructions from a CIA manual for how to sabotage organizations from the inside out. No joke, please, please Google this. Created in the 1940s uh, for World War II spies. Yeah, and they sound very familiar, don't they? Very familiar. And there's so many good ones in here. Those, that was just a few of them. These are some of the other uh, really choice ones. Uh, make speeches, talk as frequently as possible and at great length. Uh, refer all matters to committee for further study and consideration. Insist on perfect work in relatively unimportant products, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of scary. Yeah. Sad thing is this feels like another day at the office for us. There's something about the way that we work and organize that makes it harder for us to get our work done makes it harder to make decisions, slows decisions down when we need to be speeding them up. It uh, makes it harder to cooperate and collaborate with the people we need to, right? Something about that. And these problems, these things that are getting in the way at work, they're not necessarily new. This picture here is called the Vasa warship. It was built in the 1620s for the king of Sweden. Tell me if this project story sounds familiar to you. Um, so the king, the boss, says, I need to have the biggest and best warship in the world. Tells this to his ship builders, his ship designers. Go out and make it for me. So they, they go, they do. Um, it has to have more, more guns than any other warship. It has to be bigger than any other warship. So as they get into the work, surprise, surprise, they run into some problems, right? Um, but no one feels like they can actually speak up about it. No one feels like they can go back to the king and say, guess what? We can't have as many guns on the ship as you want it to have. It can't be as big as you want it to be. We can't launch it on the day that you want to launch it. We need to push back the launch date by a couple months. Nobody feels like they're able to say that. So instead, they just plow forward, go on with it. And what happens is that they launch the ship. It is the biggest and the best. It does have uh, more, uh, more guns than any other ship uh, in the world. But before it even gets one mile out to sea, it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Does that product launch story sound a little, a little bit familiar? <laughs> right? And one more story. Um, this image on, on the right here is the first ever org chart. It's created in 1855 by this guy here named Daniel McCallum for the Erie Railroad. And it's a beautiful uh, document. It's beautifully designed. Um, again, I encourage you to Google it, take a close look at it. It's really incredible. Um, but the other thing about it is that when you do actually take a close look at it, it's basically like every org chart you've ever seen. It's a hierarchy of people and reporting relationships. 
And the other thing that's very familiar about it is the way that it was created. Um, Daniel McCallum, the, the expert, um, went off pretty much by himself, um, came up with this beautiful, perfect org design plan, brought it back to the organization, said, I figured it all out, everybody. Just follow these instructions, organize yourselves these way, this way, and everything's gonna work out just great. Guess what? It wasn't quite as perfect as they thought, right? And within weeks, within months, um, people at the edges of the organization, middle managers started speaking up and saying, actually, this isn't quite working for me. I need to cooperate or collaborate with this person who's now over in this region or, or that division, and I can't get to them as easily as, as I need to. Or I need to be able to make quick decisions on this, and now I need to run that decision up the hierarchy, up the chain of command to get an answer on it. It's not working for me. And within a couple months after this was rolled out, Daniel McCallum was fired by the board. Yeah, again, do, do these stories sound familiar? Have you ever seen an org design uh, project that goes a little bit like this? So the way that we work and organize ourselves hasn't changed that much in a long, long time. And yet, of course, we know that the world around us, on the other hand, has changed a lot, especially over the past like 10, 20 years. The pace of change, the, the, um, the enormity of the change we've seen is, has been incredible. One quick um, example of that when you think about technological change, compare the Univac 1, which was the first commercially available computer, to the iPhone X. The iPhone X has 3.5 million times more memory, but it's just 3,500 times smaller and it costs 11,800 times less than that Univac one. And of course, fairly, the, the iPhone X at $1,000 feels like a pretty expensive phone, right? But it doesn't cost $11.8 million, which is what the Univac would cost in today's dollars adjusted for inflation, right? So that kind of digital, digital technological advancement is one of the main drivers of the change we're seeing. And it's unlocking this incredible potential um, companies seem to come up out of nowhere and create incredible value in the world. Um, this is a chart of how many years it takes companies to reach a $1 billion valuation. The average company on the Fortune 500 list took 20 years to reach that $1 billion mark. But it took Google just eight years, Facebook just five years, Uber and WhatsApp just two years, Snapchat 22 months. Oculus Rift, the virtual reality goggles company, went from being an idea on Kickstarter to being acquired by Facebook for $1 billion in just 14 months. Insane, right? So this is the potential, the possibility that we see in the world around us, right? But when we go back to our day-to-day -day work, when it feels like inside of, our, inside of most of the organizations we work with, we're asking ourselves, like Calvin here, where are our flying cars? Where is this potential impossibility inside of our own organizations? There's, there's something broken here. And I believe that the, at the heart of this tension between what's possible and what work actually feels like in reality is that most organizations today are optimized for certainty when they need to be optimized for uncertainty. that we're optimized for certainty when we need to be optimized for uncertainty. So go back to the astronauts for a second. What was the name of the first, the mission that put the first person on the moon? Shout it out. Uh, what? Apollo, Apollo 11, Apollo 11. Yeah, it wasn't Apollo 1, it was Apollo 11, right? And so even something as enormous as that, even something that had as high stakes as that, right? NASA goes into that with the assumption that the right answers, the best way to accomplish this is uncertain. And we need to do a lot of iteration and experimentation along the way in order to get there. That's what I mean by optimizing for uncertainty. And so most companies are, are, were born in the way that they operate out of this industrial model. And it made a lot of sense maybe 50 years ago or so because you could create a lot of competitive value by being better at the certain end of the spectrum than your competitors, by being better at the most repeatable 
uh, predictable kinds of work inside your organization. Imagine the work that, that you do, imagine all the work that goes on inside your companies and plot it along this spectrum, right? The certain end of the spectrum, stuff where there is a known right way to do it, right? It's, it's certain. And at the uncertain end of the spectrum is the most creative, collaborative, innovative kind of work. And that's big world changing stuff, like maybe figuring out how to put a man on Mars or, or um, you know, fig inventing a self-driving car, curing cancer. But it's also things like, what is going to be the best ERP system for our China region in three to five years from now? That's also an uncertain question. There's, there's not an obvious right answer to that. Or the best way to roll that out, right? We're gonna have to figure that out as we go. And the thing about that certain end of the spectrum, that is what computers are good at. If you can reduce a, a task down to an if this, then that statement, where there's a, a known right way to do it, a computer can solve that problem and can do it exponentially better than a human being can do it. And once that solution has become software, has become digitized, it also becomes democratized very quickly. You and all of your competitors get that software solution pretty within months of each other, right? So you still have to be good at that kind of work inside your organizations, but there's no longer any competitive advantage to being good at that stuff. What we need to be good at is the stuff that humans, at least for now, are better at than computers. And that is the most creative, collaborative, innovative kind of work. That is what human beings can do, that, that humans are not as good at yet. But working in this way, making it easy for people to, to excel at this kind of work, requires a different way of working. So, we want to bring this default to uncertainty mindset to the way that we do change management. And we've been doing that with something that we call the responsive change model. It's about making the way that we do change, making it easy for people to sense and respond to change, challenges, opportunities as they arise. It starts about making change a continuous and participatory process. It's about making it easy to try making it easy to share, easy to learn, and easy for people to contribute regardless of who they are or where they sit in the organization. And I'll show this slide again at the end so you, if you don't get a picture of it now, you'll get a picture of it later. Um, so first, how do we make it continuous and participatory? First thing is about just this idea of cadence, a steady rhythm of reprioritizing and doing our work, sharing our work as we go, iterating as we go, instead of waiting until we feel like things are ready or, or only focusing on those big, longer-term milestones. As Lauren Michaels, the, the creator of Saturday Night Live, uh, likes to say, the show doesn't go on because it's ready, it goes on because it's 11.30. That's the mindset and the approach that we try to bring to the teams that we work with. Next thing, progress over perfection. This is, this is a, a kind of underlying mindset that we encourage teams to bring to their work. Um, remembering that 100% certainty is a fantasy. We can't keep going over this, the work over and over again. At a certain point, we gotta just send it out and be okay with, with the fact that it might not be quite perfect. And then the people closest to the work have the best data. Remember that Vasa warship story, right? Are the shipbuilders, are the ship designers at the table with you when you're making decisions? Are the people who are gonna be impacted by the decisions you make do they actually have a say? Are, is, are their perspectives being integrated into those decisions? Next, how do we make it easy to try? Easy to try new things. First thing, action meetings. So this is a, a simple replacement for your normal status meeting or update meeting that really puts the focus on what are the near-term actions that we're gonna prioritize for the week ahead and which individuals are responsible for them. Um, we use a tool for this, Trello is a really good tool. Is anyone out there familiar with Trello, trello.com? Good, a lot of you are familiar with it. Really lightweight, easy to use. Microsoft Planner does the same thing. Um, but what's great about that is that what it brings to the surface, what a board like that brings to the surface, are the individual tasks we're gonna get done in the week ahead and who is going to do them. Rather than a, a typical Gantt chart view, it's like puts the primary focus on what are those long-term work streams 
and all the, the detail about what are we prioritizing for the week ahead and who's, who's going to do it um, kind of gets buried below the surface. Disagree and commit. This is a, a way of doing decision making. Um, it was, I think this, this phrase, this idea was first coined at Intel and it's really popular at Amazon as well. It's about moving forward with, with commitments, decisions, not when everyone agrees that it's the best thing to do, but when everyone feels like it's at least safe to try. That's it. That's the bar. Um, Jeff Bezos from Amazon had a really great anecdote about this, about how they use this at Amazon in a shareholder letter from a couple years ago. Um, the, the group, the team that does uh, film production came to him and they wanted to, him to green light the production of a new film. Jeff Bezos had, had read it, he had, he had read the script, he was familiar with the film, he didn't like it. He didn't think it was going to work. He didn't think it was a good idea for them to move forward with it. But he remembered that they had this principle and there's a reason why these are the movie people and he's not. And he said to himself, you know what? I disagree and I commit. I don't think that this, is, this will be good, but I trust you. So go ahead and do it. And the commit part is really key. Once everyone walks out of that room, the team knows that they have his full support, in spite of the fact that he didn't think it was a good idea. So disagree and commit. Next, how do we make it easy to share? So first thing, multiplayer documents or just cloud-based collaborative uh, tools. The teams that we work with, we get them to adopt this default as soon as we create a document for, that our team is going to be involved in. Before we even put the first word down on the page, it lives in a shared folder that everyone on the team has access to. No more, you know, who has the latest version, can you email me, um, you know, uh, draft version 3.5 underscore Mike's copy underscore draft underscore final underscore final final final. Right? No more of that. There's one version of the document uh, that everyone has, has easy access to. Microsoft SharePoint is, is a good solution for this inside most corporate environments. Google Drive is great for this um, if you're able to use it. And then weekly ship, going back to that idea of cadence and, and moving things forward, not because uh, you feel like it's finished or it's ready, but because it's the end of the week. Um, so we encourage our teams to share their work with their sponsors, with their stakeholders every single week and iterate on it and invite that feedback as they go. Um, again, compared to the typical process, you know, imagine, you know, uh, some sponsor says, all right, we've got 12 weeks, I need this plan for X. Um, how it normally goes is that you spend a lot of time trying to get it perfect before you get any feedback. And in the days, the, the week leading up to that, that big meeting when you're going to share what you've come up with, um, you spend a lot of time really trying to nail it because you want to you get it perfect and you want to walk out of that room without having to do any more extra work, right? And what inevitably happens when you do it that way is that something is always wrong. And usually it's not because you mess things up, but just because things have changed since, since you started it. You didn't know that things changed, right? Um, so if you invite that feedback and iterate as you go, it makes the work so much easier and also you get to a better outcome faster with less effort. Next, how do we make it easy to learn? I love this, that if you take one thing away from this session, take these three questions back with you. What worked? Where did we get stuck? What might we do differently? Super, super simple, really easy to remember. And because they're, they're so easy to remember, teams that we work with start using them all the time. And there are lots of different situations where you can use these words, but it's, it's all about um, making, making that reflection moment about what's working, what isn't, as easy as possible. So two people walking out of a big meeting in five minutes while they're walking down the hall can use these questions to reflect on how the meeting went. Uh, they're also a really great way to structure getting feedback from a stakeholder or a sponsor. You walk through the work, you share your work, and then you ask them these questions. So what works about this? Where are you getting stuck with it? What might we do differently? And it leads to much more constructive and helpful feedback than you would otherwise get. The one other really great use for this, any working team, we recommend that they have a scheduled monthly meeting, half an hour, one hour, organized around these questions, where they ask themselves these questions about how they're working together as a team. 
and how things are going. And importantly, you do that during the project, not waiting until after the project's all over um, to, to do some kind of post-mortem. And next, how do we make it easy for people to contribute regardless of who they are or where they sit in the organization? How do we do that? The first one, this is so, so simple and yet makes such a big difference. Rounds. Just letting each person speak one at a time, in turn, without interruption. It sounds like a preschool rule. But when you reflect on how we normally communicate in most meetings, it's actually a big change. It makes a big difference. Because normally in, in meetings, what happens, right? Say that. People dominate the conversation. Yeah, what else? Where else do we get stuck um, in how we communicate in most meetings? Anybody, shout it out. Oh, no, we don't have, oh, you mean people using their phone instead of actually, yeah, or, or computing, not paying attention. Yeah. We talk about the same thing over and over again. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We jump to solutions too quickly. Yep. Yeah, all of these things. Loudest, loudest voice in the room dominates the conversation. We defer or default to the highest paid person's opinion, the HIPPO, H-I-P-P-O, highest paid person's opinion, right? Yeah, and also just sometimes just because of personality differences. Some people just need a little bit more space to speak up, right? And usually in most situations, the people who are in that room, the people who are at that table are there for a good reason. And it would re really be helpful to hear everyone's perspective at that table. So rounds is a simple way to do that. The e really easy way to introduce this um, in, is in the next meeting that you're in, you just say something, you just say something as simple as, you know, before we dive into a discussion on this, could we just go around and hear from everyone um, one at a time before we jump in? Something as simple as that. Um, that's a simple way to introduce it. But once you get used to this, there are some specific kinds of rounds that are really useful. A check-in round at the beginning of the meeting, and it could be something as simple as, how, did, how was everyone's weekend? Um, but just intentionally asking each person, giving each person a chance to speak up. If you do that at the beginning of the meeting, people will be more likely to speak up later in the meeting, even if that's the only round you ever do. Um, clarifying question round, reaction round, Reaction rounds are great for um, organizing structure when you want to share work and get feedback on it. Um, how, who here has you know, tried, had a 20-page 20 20 PowerPoint presentation that they wanted to share with everyone and didn't get past slide three before people started jumping in and interrupting them, right? So reaction round, you say, what you say to everyone in that room, you say, look, I have these uh, 15 slides here I want to walk through. After we get through it, we're going to do a reaction round, and I'd love to hear from each one of you. And if everyone knows what that is, then they'll, they'll be quiet and let you get through the whole thing because they know that they're going to have a chance to speak up and share, share their thoughts, right? The idea generation round, <clears throat> really simple. If you, let's say you've got 10 people in a room. Say to everyone, all right, everyone take one minute, and I want you to generate three ideas, write down three ideas for how we can solve this problem that we're looking at. In one minute, you get 30 different ideas on the table. Compare that to how things would normally go. We'd say, all right, here's the situation. What can we do about this, right? And it just jumps into this discussion, this, this kind of unfettered discussion. You probably spend the next 15 minutes talking about one, maybe two ideas. And you probably spend most of that time talking about why the first idea that was shared is a bad idea and it won't work, right? <laughs> So 30 ideas in one minute instead of one or two ideas in 15 minutes. And then lastly, a closing round, just a good way to finish up a meeting. Um, ask anyone, you know, what are they taking away from this meeting? Is there anything else on anyone's mind that you want to share before we, before we leave? Or how can we make this meeting better next week? Yeah, please. Oh, clarifying questions. Just uh, another way, like, we separate a little bit from reaction round, but again, if you're sharing your work, say, can we do a clarifying question round? Give everyone a chance to ask a question or ask questions to clarify their understanding of the work. That's it. Um, and if you, it, again, if you separate that question piece from the reaction 
piece, it can make that conversation a little bit more efficient and, and a little bit more focused and useful. Thanks for asking that. Yeah, um, team size. So team size is so, makes such a big difference. And I think it's really, really underappreciated how big of a difference it makes. So a, a good kind of guidance that we give for our teams, seven plus or minus two people. Five to seven people on a team is really a, a good sweet spot. If you can get the work done with maybe just three, three people, three to five people, that's great too. But once the team size starts getting up to nine, 10, 11, 12 people, that should start raising some flags. Because the added complexity, once you start getting up to that many people, is, is so immense. It, it doesn't go up linear, linearly, it goes up exponentially, how complicated and complex it gets. Just the calendaring alone uh, it gets so complex. So if the work really does require you know, 15, 16 people, figure out how to break that work into smaller pieces and divide it up into smaller teams. And the last one I'm gonna share here, even over strategies. So this is just a way of articulating your strategies that's phrased as one good thing even over another good thing. And by reducing it to that, that phrasing and making it that simple, it makes your, your strategies easier to remember and easier for people to use when they're act actually out there doing the work, making tough decisions, making tough calls. And the hard part here is just actually articulating two good things. Everyone will want to say this good thing even over that bad thing that no one likes. But it's much more effective if, if you can actually push yourself to say this good thing even over this other good thing that we also value. So progress over perfection is an example of one of those. Candor even over comfort might be one. Global even over local might be a choice that you're making. Um, and so. Once people have this, you know, you, you decide it as a group, this is the strategy we're applying to our decisions. People don't have to stop and run their decisions back up the chain of command um, when, when they're out there trying to get their work done. As long as they know that their decision is aligned to the strategy that we've all agreed to, they can go ahead and move forward. So that is, that is the set of tools for responsive change, the set of practices. This is the, the model. I'd love to take some uh, questions now and, and kind of get into some of the details about how this might actually come to life inside your, your companies. And before I forget, please, uh, please uh, give, give feedback in the app, in the uh, survey, fill out the survey on the app. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear some questions now. So go ahead and raise your hand and we're gonna bring a mic uh, around so that we can make sure that we hear everyone. Thank you so much. Disagree and commit. Yeah. Um, you know, not everybody agrees, but everyone can say the idea is safe to try. Mm -hmm. When you said safe to try, it brought up for me, there needs to be a trust level there yeah. amongst the team. And do you have any suggestions on how to build that trust? Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the simplest way is to, if, if you're doing this more frequently, um, another thing that helps a little bit is you might, going back to that cadence idea, you might have a decision, a, a disagree and commit decision meeting every two weeks. And that would give you um, the trust to say, we don't have to, we know that no later than two weeks from now, we're gonna, we can make an adjustment to whatever we're saying yes to right now. That's something that helps. Um, and it's really about um, when you're coming up with a proposal, is thinking about, you know, <laughs> you, you wouldn't start out by proposing, um, I need the green light to put, a, to put a person on the moon. You'd say, I need the green light to try out this one little piece of the puzzle that I think might help us. Um, so being able to articulate that, that next step, that, that next experiment that we wanna try out is really useful. Yes, down here. Uh, yes, uh, so in terms of asking the questions about like where do we go wrong, how do we do better next time, um, you know, I struggle with finding time for that because there's so many projects going on at once, yeah. so just curious to know if you yeah. have any tips on how to handle that. Yeah, um, what worked, where did we get stuck, what might we do differently? The, what we have found here is that those particular questions, um, because once, once everyone remembers them, um, it makes that, that um, you know, reflect, that reflection 
easier and more lightweight. So it doesn't have to be some big thing, like we need to find two hours for a post-mortem on this thing. It could just be, hey, can we just take five minutes at the end of this meeting to, to ask each other those questions and to share our thoughts? Um, yeah. Yes, down here. <laughs> Thanks. That's <are> awesome. <laughs> The team size. Yes, yes. I work in a huge company mm -hmm. and we do corporate wide projects. Yep. So Sounds familiar. You're saying there is is there any tips for when you because trying to break up into nine group I mean not groups yeah, of nine yeah. when you have a team of fifty. Yep. Yep. Means you're doing something five, six times. Yeah. Yeah. So is there any other strategy to mitigate when you can't um, feasibly break it up into that yeah. many? So clarifying the missions, um, so that, that's something that's going to be helpful there. Like, it might be very similar kinds of work, um, but this group is doing it for this for these stakeholders, this group's doing it for those stakeholders, this group's doing it for those stakeholders. The other important thing is really clarifying the, the distinction between the working team and sponsors and stakeholders. A lot of times what happens is that, especially with high profile projects or things that are really exciting or really important, everyone wants to be attached to it. Oh yeah. I, I, I have an opinion on that, so that means that on the PowerPoint slide that says who's on the team, I need to see my face and name there, right? Um, and we, do, we push really hard to say, yes, your face and name is on that page, but it's under the stakeholder thing, because or if you're on the working team, then that means that you're going to be making stuff for this project. You're going to be making PowerPoint slides. You're going to be making the, the spreadsheets or whatever on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Do you want us to give you tasks every day, every, every week on this project? And most of the time, no, they don't. Um, but it also goes hand-in-hand -hand with how the team um, shares and communicates their work. So if we commit to that weekly ship idea, if we commit to um, you know, working in, in public and sharing, using multiplayer documents that are accessible to everyone as we go, that really helps make, it, make people okay with saying, I don't necessarily need to be on the team because I know that I'm gonna see things as we go and they're gonna be these, these frequent moments for me to contribute and, and add my thoughts. Yes. Um, one of the areas that we struggle is finding the person who is actually in charge of making the decision, yeah. like, like your yeah. your hippo thing. Yeah. So we try to do stakeholder analysis, and but when things impact multiple departments, and you're trying to work with those managers, yep. and nobody, nobody, I don't know if nobody really wants to make the decision, or no one knows who's ultimately responsible yep. for it. Yep. So any. Yeah, that ha that's a great question. It happens all the time. The the best thing that we can do is just to make everyone write those things down and to write that down in a place that everyone has access to it. And sometimes, sometimes it is complex, um, but when you force people to say, all right, we're gonna write down who has to weigh in on this decision. And when you start writing it down, and it's like, oh, this other person has to weigh in, this other person weighs in, and they actually see the list of 10 names there because you force them to write it down, they, that helps them to, to realize maybe Maybe there are too many people who are, need to weigh in on this decision. Um, and again, that, that's not, that doesn't solve all the problems, but forcing people to write things down. And the other thing about writing things down and putting them in a place where everyone has access to it, like some kind of team charter document in that shared folder, um, is that if you write it down in a digital format, it also makes it more easily editable. So we can say we're going to start with this, and a month from now we're going to revisit it um, and see if we need to make any changes to it. And do you think sometimes people are worried they're not going to be informed of the decision after it's made yeah, versus yeah. really actually wanting to be part of the decision That's making? right, that's right. Yeah, a lot of people say that they need to be part of the decision because they want to make sure that, they're, that they stay informed. And again, that's where you know, using, working in public, using shared documents, doing some kind of weekly ship thing, that helps to mitigate that. So people, all right, I'm seeing things, I'm aware of things, I can give my input, um, so I don't necessarily need to be, you know, in on the decision. Okay, yeah. we've got time for about one more question. Okay. One, one more over here after this one, yep. So adding on to her question, how do you use the disagree and commit to avoid the kind of the swooping in of the very senior leader at the end mm. to 
change a decision that the group right. has already made. Right. Yeah, I think it goes back to that, um, you know, that transparency piece and making sure that the, the leader doesn't hear about things after the fact, um, but rather they know what led up to there. They also being clear about the, the boundaries and writing that down somewhere. So I'm okay with the team making decisions up to this threshold and anything above that, I should be involved in the decision. And if we make that explicit, then, it, then the, the, um, the sponsor is more okay with the team making that decision. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um I am currently on a team that is doing a, a lean implementation across IT. Mm -hmm. Any recommendations, because we, we work in a similar yeah. fashion, yeah. any recommendations though on how to deal with people who are caught up in the dual world where oh. there's part working like this, but then there's part the traditional waterfall steering very heavily processed. How do you manage people, I guess change management on change management. How do you help people live in both those worlds? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and that's a really hard problem to solve. I mean, the the best the best thing that you can do is try to get them out of that situation where they're one foot in, one foot out. Um, and and to make this work, there's so much work that has to happen at the management and the leadership level. They have to understand this, um, and like the idea of um, shifting to a place where we're going to be shipping kind of crappy iterations of our work every week. Um, that's a that's a shift. Um, and leaders have to show up in a different way when they're looking at that work and know that, oh yeah, it's, it's actually a good thing <laughs> for me to see work that's unfinished, that has mistakes and problems in it. Um, it's gonna make everyone's lives easier and, and better as we go. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, trying to address that, that leadership level and trying to, as best we can, you know, get people, pull people either into one place or, or the other um, is really the best thing that you can do. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, please do reach out. Get in touch. Please send me an email. Um, I'm more than happy to share these documents. We've got lots of reference materials about these practices, um, cards that you can use, that kind of thing. Um, and I'd be more than happy to share share that with all of you um, after this. And please come down and talk to me. I'm, I'm in no rush to get out of here. So uh, thank you so much. Take care. Hi.